in the first half of the 1800s, pioneer settlements like this began to spring up all across British North America. In fact, this was an age of tremendous growth for the continent as a whole, not only in terms of new settlements, but also in terms of new developments in politics and economics and technology. But above all, it was a period of rapid population growth, largely because of the arrival of huge numbers of immigrants. Between 1815 and 1850, some five million people emigrated from Europe to North America. Most of these immigrants settled in the United States, but at least a million of them made their home in Canada. This great migration, as it has been called, was many times larger than any previous population movement from the old world to the new. And if there was one force propelling this huge wave of humanity across the Atlantic, it was this, steam. Not only the steam that would eventually be powering more and more of the immigrants' ships across the ocean, but also the steam which had done more than anything else to drive these people from their homes in the first place. The principle that water expands as it turns into steam and can therefore be used to do mechanical work was first put to practical use in the late 1600s to pump water out of tin mines. Then, in the 1780s, the Scotsman, James Watt, discovered how to convert the simple up and down movement of the early steam pumps into rotary action. He thus created a steam engine that could turn the wheels of industry in everything from textile mills to coal mines to railway engines. A massive steam-powered shift from a simple rural way of life to a society dominated by machines. A social and economic upheaval that has become known as the Industrial Revolution, which soon spread across Europe and eventually throughout the world, but which began in Britain. The Industrial Revolution brought great wealth, but also great misery. Hundreds of thousands of people were uprooted. Many of them herded into factories. Working conditions were brutal. Disease was rampant. And yet all the while, the population kept on growing at an unprecedented rate. As the rich got richer, the poor got poorer and ever more numerous. Escape from these appalling circumstances was impossible while Europe was still involved in the Napoleonic Wars. But when the French emperor was finally crushed once and for all on the fields of Waterloo in 1815, the floodgates were opened, permitting huge numbers of people to seek refuge in the new world. Englishmen, Scotsmen, Welshmen, soon to be followed by Germans and Scandinavians, who had also had their lives turned upside down by the economic turmoil of the times. But the largest single group were the Irish, because it was Ireland which had suffered most of all from the havoc wrought by the Industrial Revolution. Ireland had been united with England in 1801, but the economic advantages were all one way. As England increased both her agricultural and industrial productivity, the Irish economy grew weaker than ever before. The problem was compounded by the fact that Ireland's mainly rural economy was based almost entirely on one crop, the potato. This vegetable had first been introduced to Ireland from South America in the 1500s. Since the potato is such a nutritious food, yielding four times as much carbohydrate per acre as wheat, it had first been a great boon to the Irish. By 1840, the population of Ireland had soared to over eight million people. But then disaster struck with the onset of a catastrophic potato blight in the mid-1840s, which was to cut down the Irish population by a third. 
Over a million people died of starvation, and a further million and a half literally fled for their lives to Canada and the United States, swelling the already large number of Irish expatriates in North America. This is how the Irish came to contribute far more than their fair share to the Great Migration, which sent so many Europeans across the Atlantic in the first half of the 1800s. A migration which owed its ultimate origins to the expansive properties of steam. The huge influx of immigrants to North America between 1815 and 1850 was to have varying effects on this continent. In the already quite populous United States, the newcomers were absorbed fairly easily and made relatively little difference to the basic structure of society. But in British North America, the arrival of so many people was to have a profound impact. The epic migration of a million people to British North America radically altered the ethnic composition of its population. Until the Great Migration began to gather momentum after 1815, these colonies weren't really British at all. Apart from small groups of surviving native peoples, the Maritimes and Upper Canada were populated almost entirely by expatriate Americans either Loyalists or other settlers who had moved here from the United States shortly before or after the American Revolution. And Lower Canada was, of course, still overwhelmingly French. But the flood of new colonists from Europe at the end of the Napoleonic Wars was to change all that. This multi-ethnic stream consisted in numerical order of Irish immigrants. People from England, Scotland and Wales. And families from Germany and Scandinavia. Nearly all the Germans and Scandinavians went south of the border along with roughly two-thirds of the people of Irish and other British origin, leaving the remaining third of immigrants from the British Isles to go north, with a minority settling in the Maritimes and Lower Canada, and the great majority moving on to Upper Canada. British North America, at least as far as the Maritimes and Upper Canada were concerned, was finally living up to its name. In addition to changing the makeup of the population, the Great Migration also transformed the landscape of these colonies. Except for the cultivated areas in the Maritimes and along the shores of the St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes, most of British North America was still covered by dense primeval forest with almost no sign of human habitation. In fact, until immigration began to accelerate in the 1820s, the total population still only added up to about a half a million people. But with the arrival of more than a million immigrants over the next 30 years, enormous stretches of territory were to be brought under cultivation. This was Canada's pioneer period par excellence, with the great majority of its expanding population engaged in a back-breaking struggle with nature. For at the beginning of this period, almost everyone lived off the land. In 1820, for example, British North America could only boast a handful of towns of any size at all. In the Atlantic region, there were only three substantial settlements with several thousand inhabitants each. Halifax, Nova Scotia, St. John, New Brunswick, and St. John's, Newfoundland. In Lower Canada, Although both Quebec City and Montreal were relatively developed for the times, the larger of the two, Montreal, was still only home to about 20,000 people. And in all of Upper Canada, there was a grand total of two tiny urban settlements, Kingston 
with a population of just over 2,000, and the capital, York, with a mere 1,200 citizens. But as the population mushroomed, all of these towns grew rapidly, with the greatest expansion taking place in Upper Canada. By 1850, the city of York had reverted to its original name, Toronto, and had a population of 30,000 and was now competing with Hamilton, London, Galt, and Brantford. The commercial life of British North America was also changing. Already, by the early 1800s, the traditional exports of fish and fur had been overtaken by a third commodity, forests. The Canadian timber business had begun as a side effect of the Napoleonic Wars. When French blockades had cut Britain off from her wood supplies in Northern Europe, the British Navy had turned to Canada for the masts and spars of its fighting ships. With their numbers boosted by all the new immigrants, British North Americans soon developed such a thriving forest industry that at Quebec and in the Maritimes, they began building wooden ships of their own. This was the origin of the famous Nova Scotian Blue Nose schooners and clippers, whose figureheads were to grace so many of the world's merchant ships. So the first half of the 1800s was a time of accelerated growth for British North America, from its farms to its cities, its culture to its commerce. Canada was coming of age, largely because of a massive infusion of new blood from the British Isles. The rapid growth of anything, whether it be a country or a human being, is seldom achieved without a certain amount of stress and strain. There are inevitable growing pains. British North America was no exception. Its surge of development in the early 1800s brought great economic benefits, but it also stirred up quite a bit of unrest. In the late 1830s, a number of violent clashes occurred between radical political groups and government forces. These confrontations were part of two sometimes very bloody rebellions, which took place almost simultaneously in both Upper and Lower Canada. To understand the causes of these rebellions, we have to take a look at how British North America was governed in the early 1800s. These colonies supposedly had representative government but they operated very differently from today's democracies. Modern Canada, for instance, is governed by a cabinet, which is responsible to parliament, whose members are in turn responsible to the people. This is government from the bottom up. Back in the early 19th century, each of the British North American colonies also had a cabinet consisting of an executive council as well as a parliament called an assembly. And the members of the assembly were also responsible to the people. But that's where the resemblance ended. For the council was not responsible to the assembly. Instead, it was made up of prominent local citizens who had been appointed by the British governor of the colony. But since the governor almost always sided with the council, and since the council could ignore the wishes of the assembly, its members were free to run the colony any way they liked. This was government from the top down and naturally tended to lead to an abuse of power. The two most blatant examples were Upper Canada, where the council was dominated by a group that became known as the Family Compact, and Lower Canada, where the council was controlled by a group referred to as the Chateau Clique. Some of the great mansions of the members of these elite groups are still standing today as evidence of the wealth they were able to accumulate. They achieved this in various ways. By cornering much of the best agricultural land, and by sharing amongst themselves 
lucrative public works contracts, one of which was the construction of the Welland Canal. But in addition to being a period of industrial revolution, this was also an age of political revolution, triggered first by the American and then by the French Revolution. For Britain in particular, the early 1800s were years of widespread political reform, and many of the new liberal ideas were carried over to British North America on the great wave of immigrants. During the 1820s and early 1830s, opposition to the ruling elite in these colonies grew stronger and stronger. This opposition was especially fierce in Lower Canada, where the gulf between the rulers and the ruled also took on an ethnic dimension. In spite of the recent influx of British immigrants, at least 80% of the population of Lower Canada was still French Canadian, and the members they elected to their assembly were therefore also largely French Canadian. And yet, the Chateau clique who ran their executive council consisted almost entirely of English Canadians. So, despite their numbers, the French Canadians were dominated politically by the English and had almost no say at all in the way they were governed. But storm clouds were gathering in both Upper and Lower Canada. Two leaders emerged to focus the people's resentment. In Lower Canada, Louis-Joseph Papineau, and in Upper Canada, William Lyon Mackenzie. Things finally came to a head in the winter of 1837 when armed rebellions were launched in both provinces, heralding a new era in the political evolution of Canada. On the surface, the rebellions of Papineau in Lower Canada and Mackenzie in Upper Canada look fairly similar, and they certainly took place at almost exactly the same time. But the consequences of these two uprisings were to be very different depending on whether you were a French or an English Canadian. The immediate effects of the 1837 rebellions were much the same in both Upper and Lower Canada. Imprisonment for many of the rebels, hanging for a few of them, and exile for others with both Papineau and Mackenzie fleeing to the United States. For in the short term, these rebellions failed, mainly because they were promptly suppressed by the authorities in both provinces. But the long-term effects of the rebellions were to be of great significance. To understand this, we have first to go to England. In 1837, Britain was at the pinnacle of her power. Queen Victoria had just ascended to the throne to find herself ruling over the mightiest empire in history. On top of this, the Industrial Revolution had by now transformed Britain into the workshop of the world, supplying more than half of the entire globe's manufactured goods. In the circumstances, it was hardly surprising if the British powers that be in Westminster had become rather complacent about Canada, taking the orderly development of their North American colonies for granted. But the Papineau-Mackenzie rebellions shocked the British out of their complacency. So they sent one of their brightest political thinkers to investigate, John George Lambton. First Earl of Durham. Lord Durham very quickly saw that the power groups, the executive councils, were indeed ignoring the wishes of the people as expressed through the assemblies. He therefore recommended responsible government for these colonies, with the councils having to answer for all their actions to the assemblies. Although this obviously enraged the members of the family compact and the chateau clique, it delighted both the French and English Canadian reformers. 
But Durham's second major recommendation was much more controversial. He believed that the crux of the Canadian dilemma was racial conflict between the French and the English. As he said in his report, I expected to find a contest between a government and a people. I found two nations warring within the bosom of a single state. Durham's solution was quite simply to attempt to turn the French Canadians into English Canadians by proposing that the mainly French Lower Canada and the predominantly English Upper Canada be merged into one united province. Since Durham was coming from a supremely confident England, then at the height of its powers, he assumed that the French Canadians would be rapidly assimilated into the all-powerful British culture, so that there would soon be only one nation within the bosom of a single state. In due course, the British government accepted both of Durham's recommendations. The union of the two Canadas was ratified in 1841, and by 1848, all the British North American provinces had achieved responsible government. So Lord Durham's response to the Papineau-Mackenzie rebellions was both good and bad, depending on your point of view. For Canadians as a whole, it was a giant step forward in terms of political maturity. But for the French-speaking population, the Durham report was seen as a bitter blow, a blueprint for the slow death of French Canada. If the development of the eastern half of British North America between 1815 and the 1850s was determined to a large extent by external influences, immigration from the British Isles. The same could also be said of the emergence of Canada's far west towards the end of this period. Only in the case of the west, the external influences came not from Britain, but from the United States. This is Fort Langley on the Fraser River, not far from the present day city of Vancouver. It is a reconstruction of a Hudson's Bay Company depot that dates back to 1827 and which can claim to be the birthplace of British Columbia. But this Canadian province might never have come into existence at all if it had not been for certain events which took place in the United States. The first 50 years of the 19th century witnessed the greatest territorial expansion in American history. At the end of the 1700s, the United States only extended as far as the Mississippi. Almost everything west of this river belonged to Spain, including the western half of Louisiana that the Spanish king had acquired from Louis XV after the fall of New France. But at the turn of the century, Napoleon reclaimed the area for France and then resold it to the Americans three years later. With one stroke of a pen, this Louisiana purchase doubled the area of the United States. Now the settlers and land speculators who were already streaming across the Appalachians were able to cross the Mississippi as well and to dream of dominating the landscape all the way to the Pacific. The trouble was, quite apart from the native people's ancient rights to this land, there were also two other groups of people who had a stake in the region. In the south, the Spanish rulers of Mexico. And in the north, the British. The southwest region claimed by Mexico stretched from Texas to California, while the northwest region claimed by Britain extended from California to Alaska. When the border between the British colonies and the United States was drawn in 1818 along the 49th parallel as far as the Rockies, both sides agreed to share the Oregon country west of these mountains. But within a few years, Hordes of American settlers were crowding into the region, and the United States government 
began to make very aggressive claims on the whole area, right up to the borders of Alaska. It looked as if the War of 1812 was about to start all over again. Luckily for Canada, the attention of the United States was soon to be distracted by what was going on in the South. In 1846, the American president annexed the Mexican Republic of Texas, thus sparking a full-scale war with the Mexicans, who went on to lose not only Texas, but California and everything in between. While the battle was raging in the South, Britain was able to negotiate a treaty with the United States that extended the 49th parallel to the Pacific and gave the British all the land north of this line in addition to the whole of Vancouver Island, which, just in case the Americans changed their minds, the British declared a crown colony in 1849. Now that the international boundary was completed coast to coast, it seemed that the threat of an American takeover of Canada had been averted once and for all. But not so. In the same year that Vancouver Island became a British colony, the Americans discovered gold in California. This led to such a frantic scramble for instant wealth that within a few years, the California gold fields were played out. However, in 1856, there were reports of gold deposits on the Canadian side of the Oregon border. This brought American miners rushing up the coast in such numbers that British authority over the area was threatened once again. To secure her hold on the northwest coast, Britain proclaimed the mainland region another crown colony, with its capital at Fort Langley. To commemorate the Columbia River, and to make quite sure that there were no more misunderstandings with the Americans, Queen Victoria named the new colony British Columbia. We began this series in a Canadian citizenship court, and this is where we will end it, at the place where people become citizens of the nation called Canada. This is because it was only during the period covered in this last program, the 1860s to the mid-1880s, that Canada took a major step towards nationhood and subsequently united from sea to sea, Amari, Usque, Admari. But 
as we've seen throughout all of our origins programs, Canadian history is intimately bound up with the history of many other parts of the world, in particular with the history of the United States. In fact, in order to understand how Canada became a nation, we have first to know something of the agonies the American nation was going through in the early 1860s. Between 1861 and 1865, the United States was torn in half as three million Americans took to the battlefield in one of the most devastating civil wars the world has ever seen. underlying causes of the conflict was this plant, cotton. By the mid-1800s, the economy of the southern states was almost entirely dependent on the cultivation of huge quantities of cotton, which made up more than two-thirds of the total United States exports. But during this period, the production of cotton required an enormous amount of manpower and depended on the labor of no fewer than three and a half million black slaves in the South. In the northern states, the situation was quite different. Here, a variety of industries were already taking hold. The economy in general was much more diversified. So the North could afford to dispense with slave labor and piously condemn the practice. When Abraham Lincoln was elected president, largely by northern voters, he tried to prevent the expansion of slavery in the South. This raised the whole question of whether the federal government had the right to dictate the internal affairs of individual states. The southerners claimed that it did not. And in 1861, 11 southern states seceded from the Union to form the Confederate States of America. But Lincoln was determined to keep the country together. And soon, the blue-coated soldiers of the Union Army in the North were at war with the Confederate Greycoats in the South. The carnage that resulted cost hundreds of thousands of lives. But the very scale and intensity of this conflict entailed the building up of huge and very efficient fighting forces by both sides. By the time the North had prevailed in 1865 and the United States was intact once more, America possessed one of the most powerful armies on Earth. The implications of this military buildup were not lost on the inhabitants of British North America. The US had already attempted to invade these colonies in 1775 and then again in 1812. And as recently as 1846, the Americans had threatened to take over the Northwest Coast. But now, in the 1860s, they were in a stronger position than ever to invade their northern neighbors. And they were certainly in the mood to do so. Again, this was partly because of cotton. Since the British textile mills were by far the largest consumers of American cotton, Britain's rulers tended to favor the southern cotton producers during the Civil War. They allowed the South to have warships built in Britain, and even turned a blind eye when Confederate troops carried out a raid on the northern states from Canadian soil. And although many Canadians sympathized with the North, and had in fact provided a refuge for thousands of runaway southern slaves before the hostilities began, it was the general pro-Confederate stance of the British that the Americans remembered. So when the war ended, it seemed more than likely that the United States would decide to strike back at Britain by invading her North American colonies. After all, the Americans had now filled in almost all the blank spaces on the map south of the border. <laughs> 